divorce. Under certain circumstances, there is an obligation to give a divorce. But a divorce is only effective if it's willing. So the solution is that we coerce you until, uh, until, until you're willing. Now, the purpose of this is to avoid what we call the unfortunate negative. In circumstances where, in circumstances where there are, um, where there are husbands who really, really should divorce their wives, and they're not willing, so we engage in what we call constructive consent. <laughs> now, but to show you, right, to show you how, right, how how much this is built on a principal dedication to purposes. So we tell you that, right, so there really are two, right, really, in one case, right, there are two cases of coerced, of, uh, there's a case of coerced marriage, and the case of coerced marriage, we say, really, it should be valid legally, but we utilize our, we, we, we utilize our, uh, the authority of the law to make it, right, to undo the wedding. And here, it really should not be a divorce, and we utilize the power of the law to make it a divorce. Right, so, you have, right, so you have a very clear dedication to principle underlying the, right, under, un, right, underlying, underlying the use of it is, which is that women should not be married against their will, and they should not remain married against their will. In right, each circumstance, right, even, though it's, even though it seems that her consent might be valid, we undo it, and even though it seems that his consent might be invalid, right, we create it. So I want to set out, and I think that this is, a, um, that the underlying premises of halachic divorce law really are um, focused on interpreting the nature of the process as being the husband initiates it and hands it to the wife as being not about giving the power to the husband, but about giving the proof um, to the wife. And having understood it that way, <coughs> the rabbi, I think I can show a pattern where right, you, you learn a lot about what the rabbis think the purpose of the law is by the times when they are obviously willing to put in complicated mechanisms. And again, not to, I think that the mechanisms are all intellectually honest. They all are valid legal mechanisms. But there's, you can't say they didn't have a choice. You can't say they had to say this. No, they didn't have to say this. They chose to say this. They chose to say this because that's what they understood the purpose, uh, the purpose of the law um, as being. The purpose of the law was that People, right, that women should be able to be divorced, um, particularly in circumstances such as husbands and wives living apart, um, or circumstances where we would rule that there is an affirmative obligation to divorce. So in those circumstances, the job of the, religion, of the halakhic system is to ensure the divorce happens. And secondly, to make sure that whenever a divorce happens, that it meets the original uh, biblical, um, biblical directive, which is that the outcome of divorce is that the woman is free. And being free means that you can prove um, that you were divorced. Um, so in practice, um, the, what we do in a Beitin is we try and make sure the purpose of having divorce take place in Beitin as opposed to take place privately is that if it takes place in Beitin, every single step of the process can be, um, can, right, can be demonstrated and there's no, there's no possibility of challenging it. Anytime you do it privately, you always run the risk <coughs> that somebody and somebody claims I deliberately did something to sabotage it. But if you run it through a court, to the courts, so the, a, whole, a whole lot of the purpose of the ritual of divorce in Beit Yen is designed to make sure that there is no circumstance, there is no way in which the husband can, um, can ever make a claim that he didn't intend the divorce to be valid. And that way we can always ensure that the, um, that the, the possession of the document, although as we'll talk about next week, it turns out actually that to really make sure of this, we make sure, right, what really happens is that the woman actually never gets the document nowadays. Uh, the woman holds on to the document, acquires it, and then immediately hands it back to the Beitin, and the Beitin files it because if the woman ever had to produce the document again, that would run the risk that somebody would look at it and declare it invalid. So actually, one of the main functions of the Beitin is to file the document and produce a receipt which serves in lieu of the document, so that now the woman has a right. The woman has an unchallengeable claim, right? Not just formally, but practically, since nobody can ever actually obtain the document. Um, so, I, right, so as to challenge it. You burn it. Pardon? You burn it. We don't burn it, no, because what happens if she loses her receipt? Right, so we might need to go back to the original document so that we can issue a second, right? So that we can issue a second receipt. 
right? So we file, right? So we file it. Um, although, uh, although um, it's also a great idea to have computerized records, and I suspect that if the Beitin has a right has a solid ledger of who was divorced, right, we, sh we can produce a receipt off a receipt. Mm -hmm. right, we don't actually need the, we don't actually need the original, uh, but the the custom has always been to maintain the original, and when asked for a second receipt, to go back to the original document. So why can't someone challenge the original document? We won't let them see it. <laughs> <laughs> we also declare, by the way, that uh, at the red, that anybody who ever challenges the document for the moment is given is in violation of a serious a ser of a serious set of evil oaths and is likely to die horrible deaths you know? <laughs> <laughs> and things like that. We try everything we can, uh, but what I, but I want to well, hope to show is that right, really that the the fun the bait in here is fulfilling a. Um, it's fulfilling a biblical function, right? As understood by the rabbis, that this was really they saw this as the whole purpose of the procedure. It's to make sure that the right, it's to make sure that the end of the divorce process is the possession of a unchallengeable receipt. On the hands of the wife. Yes. Yeah. I'd like just to suggest another way to frame what's going on here. Yeah. All of these involve situations where a choice has to be made between two undesirable results. Mm -hmm. Either someone being at a guna Un unnecessarily or an adulteress unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. And consistently the choice is to avoid an unnecessary aguna even at the risk of an inadvertent adultery. And that strikes us as uh, startling because we're Ashkenazi Jews and we live in a Christian environment in which celibacy is a quite acceptable and morally clean way to live, and adultery is an uh, absolutely mortal sin. So to us, it's, uh, it, it's striking that this choice, but it seems in every case that's the choice that's made. So we should, I should be careful about two things. One is that, I, as many of the cases I set out, there are, there are disputes about this. Right? Where this is one of the options offered in every case, but you have to, you have to go through in each case to determine which, which way the law follows. And many of these issues are still controversial, as to which way the uh, as to which which way the law which way the law goes. Whether in fact we choose the, we, we choose the risk of um, which we we choose to avoid agunot even at the even at the cost of producing adulteresses, and that and then more I would say is that usually we try and what we do is we make that as our basic choice, but then we get rid of the adultery risk also. Right, by making sure that, right, that right, what, I, what, I, what I think I'm trying to show is that the rabbis are presented with a case where, the, where you could say that it's a choice, and if they had to make a choice, they would probably choose, choose, right, choose avoiding agunah, right? But then they consistently end up not, right, not, right, not making that a real choice. They consistently end up saying that if we're going to choose to avoid agunah, we're not going to take the. We're not going to allow some people to end up being trapped into adultery as a result. So we'll find some way to make sure that even if we were wrong, they're not adulteresses. I guess what's striking me is the sense to which it seems counterintuitive on the basis of the moral world in which we live, in which you would assume that you would rather take the risk of unnecessary celibacy rather than the risk of adultery. Uh -huh. So I think and in the. the I guess I don't live in enough of a Christian world. Uh, it seems to me that the premise of halacha all the way through is that um, celibacy is uh, an unreasonable cost to impose on human beings without the strongest of motivations. And there are other circumstances in which we construct consent um, in, order to avoid, right, in order to avoid, right? I think that enforced celibacy halachically is treated as a, as a terrible wrong to do to somebody. So I don't, you know, I, it is counterintuitive in our society, so I'm happy to be authentically Jewish. Um, <coughs> yes? It sounds like, if I were to, in, in listening to you, that, we, that in most cases, a solution can be found for, for an Agunah. But it seems to me I hear, it, that's not quite what I read or, or kind of hear. It seems like it's a, it's a problem of that, uh, and that there are many women who are trapped in, who are not able to, to, to have this happen to them. So, 
All right, so that, yeah, I'm tempting whether I should make that a separate week. I'm not planning on it because I spent this Monday talking about that. Um, so I'll get, you know, so I'll try and do like a, I guess it's a chance to do it better than I did it Monday. Um, it's almost never the case to say that there is no theoretical solution. Um, the, for example, there is a, there is a clear solution in, in a set of cases where we believe the worst is mandatory, which is to beat the person up until they consent. Right, so that, right, that's, that's the easy answer, is that there are theoretical solutions. The, um, the second stage solution, the second stage issue is, do you have enough, uh, is to implement a solution like that, so do you want to put people in a situation where some people consider them unmarried and some people don't? Is that a worthwhile circumstance to put people into? So even if everyone agrees with the, there's a theoretical solution, if there's a practical dispute as to whether the theoretical solution can be applied here, so are you accomplishing good or not? That's a, that's a big issue, and I often um, used to require it of my students, I will do it again this summer, that the Chaim Grada has a wonderful novel called The Aguna. And the story of that novel is about a rabbi who goes ahead and offers a heter to an aguna without having the communal support and the rabbinic support to carry it off. And it ends really horribly. She commits suicide, her husband commits suicide, the rabbi's family starves to death. You know, <laughs> everything goes wrong, right? Doesn't it? And that, to me, is always a cautionary tale. Um, so then, you know, but that you always have the issue, you know, do you, do you give people, do you hold people hostage? Right, you know, is there, right, can you give a veto power to the obstructionist? And I think that's a really, that's a, a real moral dilemma. But then there's a third level, level question. I think that that is um, really the circumstance in Israel, because with the, okay, so I might as well do the, I'll do the whole conceptual thing. You should recognize there is, there's a big difference between the Gunaf situation in Israel and America, and in both Israel and America there are two very, very different kinds of situations. The difference between Israel and America is that in, in Israel, people are held hostage as Agunot by a system that they would not voluntarily belong to. Whereas in America, nobody is held hostage by a system that they are not choosing to belong to. Okay, everyone, every Agunot has the option of becoming, of, right, of becoming a conservative Jew. And nothing will change outside of their community if they choose to remarry on the basis, right, or just becoming Christian, whatever it may be. They don't have, in Israel, you don't have the option because the state recognizes it. The second thing is that, there's a, is that there, are the, there is the, the actual phenomenon of women who are agunot, meaning that all the other issues between themselves and their husbands have been resolved, just the husband is withholding a get. Um, or in America, that would be the civil divorce is final. Um, in Israel, that would be, we pretty much know what the agreement would be if you, don't, right, if you would sign it. And you're trying to say, right? And that is the, the, the underlying thing, which is not really the call of Gunah, is that every divorce takes place under threat. Sometimes explicit or sometimes implicit. Those are, two, those are different issues that need to be solved. In the American situation precise, uh, specifically, what needs to be got, realized is that let's suppose that I, as a modern Orthodox rabbi, right? I can, I'm approached by a Satmar woman whose husband, uh, right, whose husband has been doing all sorts of terrible things to her. And let's suppose I were to utilize a particular rationale and say, you know what? Your marriage was contracted in error. You're free. And she looks at you and says, but you say that, right? But that's not my community. That's not right. I, right, not, right no one will marry me based on that. So this is where, you know, where I almost said tomatoes thrown at me on Monday. Um, but I kept trying to tell people to say is that the people want systemic solutions. Systemic solutions are great if I'm trying to solve my conscience. But if the majority of the women actually suffering from Agunot are not members right now of communities that accept my authority, I have to construct a solution that the authorities of their community will accept or I haven't helped them at all. I went so far, and I was really upset. Like one of the major Agunah advocates in, um, right, from Israel, you know, basically said that um, that the Agunota wouldn't accept that solutions like this or suffering from false consciousness. And really, right, really, really, any woman 
Right? Really, what we have to do is we have to give them the power to claim to claim their own culture. It's their culture. They belong to an oppressive patriarchal culture, and this is obviously a horrible abuse of them. And if they don't, right, if they don't realize this, then we right. So, okay, you know, it seems to me that, that you know they, there's always that risk that you, you know, say you're trying to help people, but you but you patronize them. So I think that's really the big. I think. To claim, right, to, for, you know, for rabbis to claim that our hands are tied, there's nothing we can do halakhically, that is rarely the case. With the rabbinic consensus, there is almost, right, right, there is almost always uh, a mechanism to do what's right. Right, the issue is, right, but if you don't have the consensus, it's not a good idea to pretend you don't. Right, and then we can have a much deeper conversation about why we don't have the consensus. Right, what could we do? To, right, to create a consensus, what kinds of solutions are most likely to create a consensus, and there, I think the correct solution is, and this is how the halakhic prenup works, is you create a solution that your community treats as ideal, but the other communities will retrospectively accept, even though they would not prospectively engage in. And that's the kind of, right, that's the strategy you try, that you try to, that you try to engage in. Um, and if we could come up with a mechanism for releasing a gunot, that even if the Haredi community and the Israeli rabbinut would not themselves engage in such tactics, but if another, but if a Beit Din did use such tactics, they would accept it post facto, that would be a great solution. Um, but there you have to be careful politically, because the more you would frame it as a clash of fundamental values, the less likely it is uh, right, that you will that you, that you will engage in that consensus. The prenuptial agreement worked because Rabbi Mordechai Willig, my teacher, spent years and years wandering around rabbis who were not members of the YU community, right, finding the ones who would be willing to say that this works, even though they would not in any way say that you have to sign it, that you ought to sign it, right. But they were willing to say this works. Uh, right. So I think that's what the uh, right. It's not the it's not the intellectual. The intellectual solution is not hard, and it's the political solution that's hard. <coughs> and I tend to think it's grandstanding to, um, right, to yell about the failure to implement intellectual solutions. And I'll say, you know, the, the challenge, which I, did, I didn't do Monday, I'd probably do this, so I require, I don't, I, I won't be in a cider condition of the prenup, I assume that's true of many, many rabbis now, but I also don't go to weddings, <laughs> right, um, in which I'm not, right, in which in which the uh, right, in which the couple haven't signed the prenup, and when students come and invite me, I ask them. And if that were a universal social condition that people would not attend weddings, right, that would have a lot of power. Um, you know, or say more radically, you know, if you if you show up at the first dance with a pink sign saying you should have signed the prenup, <laughs> yeah. but that is even harder than this. Than this. Uh, okay. I think that we'll end. We'll probably talk about this a lot more next week as we go through what actually happens. Um, okay, so thank you all, always very much. I look forward to another great summer. Yeah.